Welcome to MedTech Speed to Data, a KeyTech podcast. I'm your host, Andy Rogers, VP of Business Development at KeyTech. Each month, me and the KeyTecher are going to interview a MedTech leader and talk to them about the critical data-driven decisions they make in their programs. Hi, everybody. Welcome to MedTech Speed to Data. I'm your host, Andy Rogers. Episode 24. Today, we have Holly Rockweiler, CEO of Medora Medical. Holly, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me. I'm very excited to, to, to talk about your, your product, your story, and where you are in, in med tech development. Uh, so, so Holly, again, thanks for coming on. And um, you're, you're the second women's health guest we've had on the podcast. Uh, the prior guest was uh, talking about warming of the breast area after uh, mastectomy. I'll definitely advise or recommend listening to that episode. We'll, we'll uh, put a link in, in, this, uh, in this recording. Uh, but today, Holly, tell us the story. Where did Medora Medical come from? What is the product? How did you get the idea? So the company is just Medora. Some of our social handles are Medora Medical, but we go by just Medora. We started as a spin out of the Stanford Biosign program. So it's a fellowship program that's built around teaching a process for medical technology innovation. And the whole focus in the beginning is on finding unmet needs. And then when you start looking for unmet needs in our healthcare system, unfortunately, you can find a lot or maybe fortunately, if you're an entrepreneur and you're excited. And once you get this long list, then the program teaches you a process of really how to do diligence, frankly, and figure out what the right problem is for you to work on. And so Medora is a product of that. And so I can say a lot more about the program. I think it's a fantastic process and, and it's meant to be academic. It's, it's designed to train you in this process. So you can go off and then do this either at a large company or at a startup or you know anywhere in between. But what happened in the case of Medora and what often happens for fellows is that they get pretty excited about the product project they've been working on hands-on and end up spinning it out into a company, which so that was our case. So I can go into a lot more detail, but at a high level, we met women who had vaginal atrophy and dryness and were really dismayed by the lack of options in the marketplace. And so we said, well, there has to be better ways to treat this that could meet these patients' needs. And lo and behold, eight years later, we just published our first randomized controlled trial. So we've been working hard. A uh, lot to talk about there. I mean, the, the Stanford Fellowship, I, I do have a connection there. One of my um, college friends ended up marrying a woman who was one of the founders of a company called iRhythm uh, that spun out of the, the biodesign program. So I'm familiar with the program um, and follow them on, on LinkedIn. So great program. If you haven't checked that out, it's the Stanford Biodesign Fellowship. Is that right? Yeah, it's a fellowship. There's there's a textbook. They have a great website. There's also undergraduate and graduate classes you can take. It's, a, it's growing in popularity. And fun fact, iRhythm, one of the founders of iRhythm is on our board. So all in the family, I guess. Uh, in Baltimore here, we, we say small Baltimore, but I, I don't know what the word is for uh, for this connection here. But yeah, so I guess just back up for a second. How did you end up at the Stanford uh, Biodesign Fellowship? Were you working in industry or PhD? or? So my background's in biomedical engineering. I got my master's at WashU in St. Louis, also my undergrad degree there. And then I went on to work at Boston Scientific. So I was working in their um, cardiac rhythm division. So that's pacemakers and ICDs. And I got to work in the research department working on next generation algorithms for our products. And I was there for about five years. And that was my you know, first introduction really to the medical device industry. And it was fantastic. And I got to work really cross-functionally in that role and got exposure to a lot of things. Like I worked on an international clinical trial, but I always wanted to kind of get closer to the patient. I felt pretty far removed and liked what we were working on, but wanted to kind of just see the impact a little bit more firsthand. The company did a good job of bringing patient stories into the company, um, but I was wanting to get out in the field myself and decided that the best way to do that would be in a smaller company. But I knew nothing about a startup. And so I'd heard about the Stanford program and thought, oh, that could be a good way for me to get my feet wet and kind of understand, you know, the Silicon Valley ecosystem and see if I like it. And turns out I did. So I'm really grateful to that start of my career and learning a lot about just how things work and quality systems and things like that. And then being able to apply that basic knowledge as we've been building the company 
has been really fantastic as well. So in the biodesign program, how did you uh, decide which markets to pursue? You know, you said you, you're in the women's health space. Did you focus on that from the start or did you look at a lot of different markets and, and, and then end up there? Credit to the program. They invite you in and don't tell you where you're going to study. <laughs> they, they want you to come in and really have the, the thesis that you can be most creative actually in a, a space you haven't worked in before because you're not held um, held back by dogma, really. Um, and you're not afraid to ask stupid questions, quote unquote, because you don't know what's stupid and what's not. You really have no idea. So when we started our every year for the fellowship, they pick a different medical area to focus on. And in our case, we were focused on urology. And we looked through, you know, we got to observe a lot of excellent things. The program gives you a month of what they call clinical immersion, where you're just looking for unmet needs. So we got to shadow urologists and see a lot of surgeries and prostatectomies and talk to a lot of patients and nurses. But then we were seeing only men. So we said, okay, we got to see the urogynecologists and see, you know, what the, the urology related needs are there. And while there came across this unmet need related to vaginal atrophy. So we kind of fell into women's health. And so the program, like I said, you wind up with this long list of needs, and then you filter them over the year. And that filtering process, you start cutting out other projects, and Medora kept kind of surviving every cut. And so I feel really fortunate and excited that women's health is now a topic of conversation. There was just a menopause commercial in the Super Bowl on Sunday, like this is a whole new environment versus when we started the company. But it's been um, really thrilling to recognize how much that aligns with my own personal passions around women's rights and advocacy um, that we can apply data and technology to to help promote uh, more equitable treatments for for patients. For sure. There's incredible demand for that. So can you describe what the product is? Because it sounds like it survived a gauntlet. I mean, Stanford, Stanford, there's, there's, you know. The best ac- uh, athletics program at Stanford. There's, you know, professors. There's, there's law students. There's MBA students. Like, what, what, what is the product, and and why and how did it survive that gauntlet to be the product that you ended up pursuing? Again, I got to do a quick plug for the biodesign program at Stanford. They teach you to kind of do a lot of this filtering before you've even settled on the product itself. You're doing this analysis on the unmet need. So it's really, is this a market worth worth pursuing? Is it large enough? What are the stakeholder dynamics? What are the payer dynamics? What is the existing technology in the space? How much is understood about this condition? You know, all of those are things that we considered before ever getting to the space of brainstorming. So to answer your question, what is the product? It's a device that uses ultrasound to rekindle the body's natural lubricating mechanisms. And so what happens in vaginal atrophy and dryness, it happens post-menopause for the most part, but can also happen postpartum. But in postmenopausal women, it happens when there's a drop in estrogen. And so the gold standard treatment has always been, hey, let's just replace that estrogen. And that's worked really well, um, you know, since it started. But the problem has been that it really has not kept pace with what the modern woman is looking for. And there was just a New York Times piece um, on February 1st that came out talking about how hormones used to be really popular and then they weren't thanks to a landmark study that suggested a link between hormone use and breast cancer, heart attack, and stroke. The pendulum really swung too far in that study though. And so the public perception of hormones has really dropped. And we've learned a lot more. I mean, that was more than 20 years ago. So we've learned a lot more about for whom hormones are a good fit and when and what type of hormones to use. But that said, a lot of consumers are still confused. And frankly, a lot of physicians are even confused about who should be using them. So our understanding was, hey, we need to figure out a way to do what hormones do without hormones. (laughs) And so our key insight was to focus on, on the blood flow aspect of things. And so I can talk more about how the device works, but it's a home use ultrasound device that women can use either in addition to using hormones to treat this condition or instead of using hormones. And that's really our beachhead is women who can't use hormones or are choosing not to. And then this product would be prescribed and then used at home by the patient. Would you consider your product a bioelectronic therapy? Yeah. And, you know, it's using ultrasound. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Here at Tech, we're big fans of this space. You know, it's just kind of like hacking the body, if you will, you know, instead of using 
any sort of prescription, you're kind of just enabling the body's natural um, responses to do whatever you, you need to do. So uh, big fan of this. Uh, also ultrasound. So can you describe the use case and, and also just how the, the patient actually uses the device? The device would be prescribed by a physician and then used at home. I may have said this before. The ultrasound device itself is handheld and used entirely external to the body. So this is something that came out very clearly from our conversations with patients who have this condition that it leads to thin and friable tissue. So that leads to day-to-day problems for patients, for example, like walking, riding a bike, having intercourse, etc. So the thought of inserting anything can be kind of a non-starter for some patients. It can be quite painful. And so ultrasound allows us to to do what we want to do at a distance. So essentially we are like we said before, recreating the body's natural mechanism of lubricating, which is via blood flow, and we're doing that with heat. So the use case is, is to say the patient holds the device upright to the opening of the vaginal canal, but doesn't have to put it inside. And then while held in place, the ultrasound energy travels along the vaginal canal directly to where we need it to be to increase lubrication the most and provide the most symptom relief over time. The idea is that a woman would use it on a regular basis, probably starting out daily and then moving into um, more of a maintenance dose after achieving some symptom relief from that daily use. How long per use? Each use is eight minutes. And that was, I'm sure, informed by some, you know, first order model of the system and animal testing and general comfort threshold. Is that, is that how you came up with the eight minutes? Lots of things went into that. Also existing literature um, in, in therapeutic ultrasound about what amount of energy needs to be deposited to create the blood flow that we were looking for. Um, but then you're right, we did computer simulations. We've also done um, some preclinical work, all kind of titrating into what would be the best application, but also kind of the other feature of this, because it's a home use technology, we wanted to do, wanted to do something that you know met what the patient's we thought patients would be willing to do. And so people always ask, what well, could it be five minutes? And it's so funny that, you know, eight versus five, like it's three minutes really. But I think mentally it does. So in the future, we hope to be able to kind of develop other um, kind of modulations of the therapy to, to be like maybe a, a longer dose that's less energy per or a shorter, more intense dose to really kind of um, not require a one size fits all approach in the future. And, you know, we, we do have some exposure to ultrasound. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm curious how you impart a consistent sort of interface or how you account for patient-to-patient variability. And we'll get to the trials you're running uh, here a little bit later. But how do you ensure uh, a uniform sort of interface? We've done a lot of work on that. So what I didn't explain is that the device is used with a daily disposable or single-use disposable, I should say. That's a proprietary hydrogel, and that serves as the interface between the device and the user's tissue. That hydrogel is designed in a specific shape that we put a lot of research into to figure out how to do exactly what you're saying. You know, we have patients or, you know, people using the product who have little to no exposure to you know, how best to do an ultrasound application. So we have to make it very simple. So we also did a lot of human factors work too, you know, obviously in our training materials, but also into the device design to make it as intuitive as possible. And so really that hydrogel, it's in the shape of kind of a, kind of a half circle. It's more advanced than that, but for this purpose, that way it can kind of seat naturally at the vaginal opening, but also be appropriate for a wide array of anatomical variability, given that our patients, you know, we want to be accessible to all. Yeah. A bunch of engineering questions. <laughs> you're an engineer, I'm an engineer. I could, I could ask a, a lot of questions, but you're heating the area. I mean, did you consider just heat, uh, like, a, like a heat pad or any other sort of mechanical <laughs> means like why, why ultrasound? What is it about that modality that's the most effective? The ultrasound allows us to really pinpoint exactly where we want to target the heat in the body while being external to the body. So, you know, you can imagine if you exactly if you held a heating pad right up to the opening of the vaginal canal, well, that heat would dissipate over the distance, right? We're kind of all familiar with that. But 
if you are able to use ultrasound, you can then really focus where you're trying to go. And so we've, of course, considered and have covered in our IP other modalities, but ultrasound also had, you know, coming, going back to the patients, you know, talking to them about it, they had, it has a bit of appeal. It doesn't sound spooky or scary like RF might when you think about applying something to your um, vaginal canal or like a laser might. This was more gentle and patients kind of said to us often like, oh yeah, you know, I had ultrasound when I had a baby. If it's safe for a baby, like it must be safe for me. So I think it has a, a good um, kind of curb appeal. What, uh, I'm curious just about the therapy and the body's response. And is it more of an acute response or in, in what you've, you've started using this now? Like, does it take time? Kind of like, you know, it's still the new year. I'm still going to the gym pretty regularly here. So, um, you know, it, does it, is it something where like if you use it for a long period of time that eventually you start seeing better results or is it something that kind of works right as soon as you use it? It's um, a little bit in between. What we've found is that women start to feel some benefit in the first one to two weeks of use and have found that their max benefit is at, at around three months of use. And so the paper we just published actually followed women out to a full year to make sure that those benefits that they achieved were maintained throughout the year as they continued to use it. So um, I always use the gym analogy, actually, and that's why we talk about in the beginning, you know, if you want to use, lose weight, you have to hit the gym hard and go, you know, pretty regularly. But then to maintain that, you can back off slightly. And so we expect in the future, we could do some dose optimization and figure out um, maybe a therapy regimen that would be maybe more lifestyle <laughs> compliant that could fit to what that patient's needs are. So uh, the, the podcast is called Speed to Data. So we're going to start talking about the data. And it's, it's not like big data. We're not going to talk about, you know, number crunching and matrices and things like that. It's more about what data is important when in your product development journey and how did you go about doing that? So, you know, every podcast guest talks about, you know, user studies. So I want to understand a little bit more, what did your user study design look like and, and how did that impact the product anatomy that you're working with today? Everything's data. So like, you know, the initial conversations we had with patients and providers before we even had the concept of the device was really important data to know we wanted something that was totally external, like I mentioned. So the first user studies, I mean, we the first data we collected with humans was a IRB approved study, which we call our first feasibility study, where we were just looking to see how does this feel to a patient in this demographic, you know, with this condition. And can we prove our mechanism of action, which is around, like I said before, increasing blood flow. So we, you know, did a study focused specifically on that. And to your point, we got a lot of insights out of that as well. You know, hearing from patients, you know, how it felt, what they thought about it, if they were to do it themselves, you know, on a recurring basis, what would they be looking for in a solution? And so Kind of fast forward, each study has then pig piggybacked off the last. And so we've done in total five clinical studies and the human factors study, um, as well as the bench and computer simulation that I mentioned. And so the data has been critical to who we are every step of the way. And really it's been, it could be overwhelming thinking about all the data you do need. So for us, it was about prioritizing. It's like, what is the most important risk we need to tackle now? And how can we do that most efficiently? And so in the beginning, it was this first feasibility study. Uh, you are speaking our language. Thank you. So, <laughs> so I, I, I'm kind of interested in uh, understanding more like the human element here. And so you're, you're in the Stanford Biodesign Program. You've realized that this market has a need and you found the need. And um, I imagine you pitched the idea and it kind of got legs and maybe you just demonstrated it on you know, an elbow and, and everyone's like, yes, there, there's a need and you can, you can extrapolate that. Yes, this will increase blood flow. It's a kind of a well-known physical sort of phenomenon. Okay. You graduate and now you're going to make a, a go at it. Like, just, can you tell our audience, like, what is that feeling like? And, and, and just, and, and at the very beginning, like you knew there was a market, you knew generally you checked all the boxes from IP payer, um, you know, product design and, and roughly there's, you know, a path to market. Like, what what was the initial data set that you were looking to gather with, I assume, relatively little funding and not much of a team put together? Exactly. 
So what's the initial feeling? It's still a feeling I feel now. It's like thrilling and terrifying all the same time. As a first-time entrepreneur, never had done this before, but you know, drawing on my experience at Boston Scientific, I had done clinical research before and I knew a lot about that. And so for us, when we graduated from Biodesign, we had filed our first patent. We had an idea, we had a nice pitch deck, and we had been talking to a lot of advisors in the program and others and really getting the feedback that, okay, you know, you're connecting these dots from the literature. It makes sense, but give me a reason to believe. And so we said, okay, we need to go to the clinic and we need to get some real patient data to show that this idea truly has legs. And so we had a lot of support from Stanford. We got a small $10,000 grant and that's what kicked off our first study. And again, lots of support from various clinicians who believed in it and helped us get that um, study going and actually run that study with us. Um, and so that data was was really most critical to give people a reason to say like, huh, Yes, we know ultrasound increases blood flow in skeletal muscles, but turns out it also can increase blood flow in, in the smooth muscle of patients who have vaginal atrophy. And then we had to connect the next dot with more data in our next study. This is where I ask you a question that we'll use for an ad uh, on LinkedIn. So uh, I think I know the answer to this, but how did you hack getting that early you know, IRB feasibility data with really little funding and, and really no functional prototype of your product. How did you end up getting that data? Yeah. Oh, and you, I wanted to talk about team also because it was technically only me full time, but my co-founders were very supportive and doing a lot to, um, there were four of us who co-founded the, the company in idea and then two of us who really took it forward. And so my other co-founder, he had a full-time job, but he was helping, he's a mechanical engineer. And so he was making the devices that we would use in the study. So the good news is with ultrasound, it's been around for a long time. There's a lot of different commercial products that exist. And so we kind of hacked some of those. So we modified existing off-the-shelf ultrasound. We did some 3D printing and we're able to come up with a prototype that doesn't look anything like our device today, but functions a lot like it. And we're able to test that. And so we, to the point, had very little funds, but had enough kind of the in-kind support from being within the university to really help. And so key to that was our physicians who helped sponsor the study and promote it. And when I say sponsor, it's not like they gave money, but they, you know, put their reputation on the line for it. So I want to, you know, help promote this research and, you know, let's figure out how we can make it happen. And so a lot of resources came together to, to really make it happen. So you had a, a 3D printed sort of modified ex off the shelf ultrasound probe that was used in a very kind of controlled study, IRB study, and the results of that pointed to, you know, I assume a qualitative sort of uh, response from the patients like, yes, this feels generally better or there's more blood flow. I don't know how you would sort of evaluate that at that stage, but. Yeah, so the first study was all about blood flow. And so we were able to quantitatively measure changes in vaginal blood flow. Um, we borrowed from other areas of research who look at vaginal blood flow changes for say arousal research, for example, in, in sexual functioning research. And so that study, you know, we used our modified prototypes, we measured changes in blood flow, and then we had a bunch of surveys that we collected too, and a lot of anecdotes as well, because it was a small study talking to patients about their experience. We then used those results to get another grant to let us run another study that was longitudinal. So we were able to take further modified prototypes and have women use them on a repeat basis. And then we said, okay, we know blood flow was positive. Let's see if that's actually translating to symptom relief in the long term. And so that study was also grant funded um, and we started raising investment at that time. Our first seed money came in and I think we, we also got our NSF grant around that same time. So all of this kind of started coming together to build that study and those data were what we used to really catalyze the company. So raise our series A, further develop our product and then run the study that just published um, last week. Can you talk a little bit about the, the simulation you said you put together as well? I assume that informed that early prototype where you're just creating a model of the human body and the ultrasound probe and the interface and kind of dialing in what the therapy should be. Although it's not, it always, you know, when you tell a story, it always sounds linear. It definitely was kind of 
more circuitous than that in the sense of, you know, working on all these things in parallel, as you can imagine, as small startups, you are, you're pulling from what you can. And so, um, you know, my co-founder did a lot of work with creating tissue mimicking material and doing, you know, testing with that. We also did some kind of, you know, using meat you know, from the butcher, doing some testing with that. And then we did also computer simulations and we worked with um, one of the premier um, labs in the world that does the computer simulation modeling of ultrasound. And so they're based in London, University College London, Brad Treby is the lab. And that's been fantastic too, because they've built this whole toolbox essentially that you can put your device into and kind of see how it works. And we were able to test a lot of questions there in the simulation that we could then also look at on the bench and kind of, as you know, these things go, use each one to kind of validate the other and say, does this all make sense? Yeah, that's fascinating. Yeah, I hadn't heard of the University of College London um, lab over there. So they'll kind of like a TurboTax for ultrasound systems say, <laughs> I don't know if they would like that. <laughs> Like enter all your parameters. You mentioned it was a simulation, right? So you enter all your parameters and... It's not like you can just dial up their software and use it. <laughs> so we worked very closely with Dr. Treby and he helped us set it all up and my, um, our CTO ran this process, but the results were really helpful and we've used in conversations with FDA as well. So it's been um, a really great partnership and we're really grateful to all the work they've done. I mean, I can't even tell you how many papers I knew at one time that they've published on their toolbox that they've developed, as you know, then you have to translate that to the lab and real life. And so it's been exciting to knit those all together. I'll have to admit, I, I'm impressed, Holly, with, with the sort of systematic approach sounds like you've taken to get to where you are. You know, this is what we're doing, which is, you know, understand user needs, what you need to prototype, get the data you need and iterate and mature along the way. It, it, it does sound like a a linear, but I understand it's non-linear. So my next tough question, there've been a couple softball questions, but um, you said it's uh, eight years in the making. At a high level, like what has taken so much time for our audience, if I may? Going back to one of your earlier questions too, of you know what, what was the feeling when we started? No idea how long it would really take. <laughs> so I wonder if that's kind of important. <laughs> to think, oh, it should just happen X, Y, and Z, and it should be done. Um, maybe other founders don't feel that way, but maybe I needed that to really feel like I could jump in all the way. Like, yeah, this should be great. Um, and it has been great. There's certainly lots of ups and downs. But what the slowest part has been fundraising. And we have a lot of great supporters, but it is, um, I mean, that's every CEO's number one job, but it is, it's a slow process. So Holly, in the women's health space, what are investors asking you for today that are driving these investing decisions they're making? You know, in our space, really data is key. So I guess on theme to our podcast here, um, really want to see what data we've collected and what our plans are going forward, as well as what we understand to be the requirements, not just from the FDA, but also from payers to make this ultimately be as successful as possible in the marketplace. So charting out that path, showing what data we have collected, and then explaining why we have confidence about our strategy and why it is the right strategy. Obviously, as much <laughs> as you can, also giving comps of why this is an exciting area to invest in and will lead to exciting returns for them as well is really critical. And you can show how you are on that path and how you've had conversations with some of these potential acquirers and are really see the value of partnering in the future, potentially, if, if it's a good opportunity for, for all sides. Got it. So talking a little bit more about that data, you know, vaginal atrophy and these studies that you're running to, to show that there's increased blood flow consistently over time. Can you just talk about, you know, a little bit more about the data you're collecting in these studies? Yeah. So we focused um, early on about the blood flow. And that was really critical, like we talked about for our mechanism of action. But now going forward, it's also about symptom relief. I mean, that's ultimately what matters. So we're using validated patient reported outcomes, also known as surveys, to get at, you know, how patient symptoms are changing over time. And then we're also using clinician assessments of the um, vaginal tissue itself and using their assessment of how it's changing over time. Those are our two most important um, 
pieces of data that we collect, but also we're looking for all kinds of other information about how this is affecting patients' quality of life, how, what they think about the device, what feedback they'd have to the manufacturer about how to improve it, what they think of the training materials, et cetera. I was expecting a response a little bit more scientific. And so maybe it's just very challenging to design these studies, like actual temperature or swab data, you know, things like that. That's what I wish we could answer you with. <laughs> the p- challenge is, is that because it's a field that's been underinvested, there are not a lot of tools that we can use. So as an engineer, you and I could brainstorm probably pretty quickly, you know, at least 10 ways we could measure maybe some benefit of the, you know, some increase in lubrication, for example. But none of these tools, there's been some in the literature, so I want to give credit to those researchers, but none of these tools have been validated. And so as a startup, we have to really think about where we spend our resources. And so we can't go off and spend, you know, X years, X million dollars validating XYZ tool until much later when we have a huge R&D budget. Um, so we're kind of trying to use the best of what we have today. And for example, this this survey that we use is great. It was just validated, you know, a handful of years ago, I think five years ago. And prior to that, there really wasn't even a survey that we could have used that was really appropriate for this patient population. And so that's been a big surprise to me, having come from a cardiology world where you got all kinds of great endpoints you can look at and they're very objective, kind of hard endpoints, very clear. This is different, but that doesn't mean it's not important and valuable. And we hope that our research helps contribute to the broader kind of understanding of that we need more tools and we can expand on the tools we have. So one other comment on, you know, what the questions investors are asking, I, I sort of glossed over the payer perspective, but I'm assuming there is reimbursement for this therapy. And so as an investor, it's easy to look at the revenue that you'll generate with this product. Is that true? I wish that was true. (laughs) So reimbursement does not exist for this product today because this product has never existed before. But broadly speaking, reimbursement does exist for uh, the gold standard treatment of vaginal atrophy. So hormonal treatments are covered by insurance. And so that precedent is there. Because this is brand new, we need to develop the reimbursement. So we're already working on that now by getting input from payers on our clinical trial design, for example, to make sure that we're delivering the evidence that they'll need to make a positive coverage decision when this is approved. For our audience and for me as well, uh, and Keytech, what does that look like, lobbying uh, payers to provide sort of confidence that they will reimburse this product when, when it is, in fact, improved? What does that look like? Yeah, right now it's data collection. We're talking to them about what they would be looking for, kind of explaining the product, learning from other products that have gone through the process and gotten favorable coverage decisions and also the ones that haven't and kind of learning from that. And frankly, also being led by our fantastic reimbursement consultant who specializes in first in human technologies. And so I'm learning a lot as we go from her. But one of the key points is that it's never too early to start thinking about this. You don't want to get to the finish line and then say, okay, you should have, you should have covered this now, right? Like, just like any stakeholder, they need to be brought in and their needs considered and thinking about, you know, really what the pitch is to them and why it should be covered. All right. So, Holly, we're getting towards the end here. I just have a couple uh, high-level questions for you. And, um, you know, as you were talking and, and telling your story, I just keep thinking about the timing is everything sort of uh, you know, mantra. Uh, it sounds like you were, you're very much a trailblazer early on. And now you're, the market is catching up to where you were in, in terms of the investors asking good questions and engaging more. So uh, you can't answer this next question by saying you'd start later. But if you would uh, go back and, and do this again, let's say for, you know, people that are, you know, in the biodesign program even, or um, entrepreneurs that know they have the tools and can do this, like, what would you do differently? I, you did everything right from an engineering perspective, prototyping and, um, you know, getting these early trials done. Like, what would you do differently? I think it's easy to make it sound like we've done everything right. And I appreciate the compliment, but there's a lot of ups and downs along the way for anyone who's in our shoes. They can understand that completely. You know, recently we've taken a bit of a different approach to our strategy and that's come from kind of responsive being trying to be responsive to the market we find ourselves in now and it's like wow why didn't we think of this before we could have been doing this strategy before and I say that I'm like not someone who really thinks like this though because 
well, we're here today because of everything we did before. So we may not have been able to do that before. And, you know, everything changes, right? So I don't totally think like that. I don't think I'm giving you a good answer. Yeah, you never know, you know, what you know until you're in the position to to learn that. So that, that makes sense to me. Yeah. So more, maybe more strategic analysis of where you could take this technology would be one thing you would do differently? You know, one of our values at the company is to question our assumptions. And so, you know, maybe we should have, I should have questioned some of mine earlier on. One of our investors we were talking, our existing investors we were talking to about this new strategy, we're kind of comparing, contrasting it to the old one. And she said, the old one's beautiful. It's textbook, but it doesn't fly today because X, Y, Z. And so now you need to pivot slightly. And so I think that that's, <laughs> that's a really good way to give constructive feedback to somebody to say like, yeah, yeah it's beautiful. So it's not. But I do think she's right in that it was the right strategy had we been able to achieve what we were looking for. But now that we know that that's not on the table anymore, this is much better. And so I don't know, I think maybe to the point of like making sure you're getting a diverse set of um, inputs from when you're looking for advice on things, like it's really easy to kind of get, okay, these are the people I go to on this kind of thing, or, you know, this is, this is our team. This is what we know this is what we do. And so it's nice to really branch out and, given where we are, that's caused us to do that and really think a bit differently. And good ideas can come from anywhere. Like part of this strategy came from someone saying, hey, you know, we haven't talked to XYZ consultant in a long time. Let's get his take on this. And honestly, I was like, we can, but I, I wouldn't have thought of that. Why would we do that? And it's opened up this whole new arena. I, I love that value, like challenge your assumptions. Do you kind of quarterly do that? <laughs> like force yourself to do that? Or is it kind of like, <clears throat> like an annual plan where you know, you, you're, you're taking a step back and forging forward. No, that's interesting. We haven't been as like, um, it's not like a process that we specifically follow, but at the company, you know, we try to live our values. And so when someone's in a meeting and they want to, you know, say, Hey, you know, I think something totally different, they might evoke, invoke that value. And we do have other processes where we make sure we're always, we have a monthly meeting where we look back over the last month and try to see like, what have we learned from that? And what do we want to take forward and try to give ourselves a space to reflect? Because as I'm sure you feel, it's like constantly hustling does not give you time to really <laughs> coalesce what you've been thinking into kind of actual steps moving forward. Also, when someone pulls the values card in a meeting, you kind of like pause the rec the records and, you know, they, they definitely have the floor. So that's good that you, you have that structure and, and that sort of, collegial environment, it sounds. So, all right, Holly. So for our audience here, what's on tap uh, for Medora here in, in the new year? As I've already mentioned, probably like a broken record, we're very thrilled that our paper was just published last week. That was our first randomized controlled trial of our technology. Our second randomized controlled trial, we're actually presenting at a conference in March. It's the International Society for the Study of Women's Sexual Health, ISHWISH is their acronym, um, which is really exciting for us. And then we are always looking for folks who are more interested to learn more about the company as we move forward um, and work towards the next set of data and bringing the product to market. That's great, Holly. Thank you so much for sharing your story of Medora and eight years in and I wish you nothing but success here as you mature the company further. Well, so thank thanks you. again for coming on. Thanks for having me. It's my pleasure. Thanks for tuning in to MedTech Speed to Data, a key tech podcast. Join us each month for more ways to get the right data faster to inform critical decisions. Find additional resources on our website, keytechinc.com. If you like this episode, don't forget to subscribe and please leave a review on iTunes whenever you listen. Thanks. Thanks.